Thank you. <clears throat> I hope you've all had a, had a good conference. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably best known. My name name's associated with continuous delivery, and so um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about that. Uh, so I want to ask you a question. Uh, what is it that you think of when you hear the phrase continuous delivery? Maybe, being, being egotistical for a minute, maybe it's my book. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Uh, maybe it's the State of DevOps report, which analysed the practices of continuous delivery and measured their impact on software development delivery. I think the State of DevOps report is now up to something around 45, 46,000 different surveys, covering probably tens of thousands of different soft software projects. And we've got data li like we've never really had before about that says things important about our industry and the science behind capturing that data and collecting it is uh, captured in this book, Accelerate, the science between lean and behind lean and DevOps, uh, principally written by Nicole Fosgren uh, with uh, Jess Humble and Gene, Kim as, Gene Kim as co-authors. Um, <coughs> one of the things that the state of DevOps stuff is built upon is, is this model of, of measurement. They, they measure the performance of software teams based on throughput and stability. Throughput is a measurement of efficiency. We could say it's a measurement of speed. It's based on the lead time, how long it takes to go from commit to something releasable, and uh, the frequency with which you deploy changes into production. It's a combination of those two measures. And stability is a measure of quality. And it measures um, the change failure rate, how often do you introduce a defect into production or wherever it is that you're measuring it, and how long does it take you to recover to that point in the process when you find a mistake. So these are two measures that essentially move, measure the efficiency with which we create software and the quality with which we, we create it. And what they found is kind of dramatic. The difference between high performers and low, low performers is really quite dramatic. We're not talking about small percentages improvements here. We're talking about sometimes orders of magnitude and better improvements in performance in these, on these measures. High performers um, uh, are, are, are um, 208 times um, more frequent, in their, uh, faster in their lead time. They're 106 times faster deployment frequency. 2,600 times fewer defects overall when you start measuring these things. These, these are massive numbers. And the, the big idea that comes out of these is that these are measures of speed and quality. And this is kind of counterintuitive to some degree, but there's no trade-off between speed and quality. In fact, kind of the reverse. If you want to go fast, you need high quality. If you want to do high quality, you need to go fast to get the feedback good enough. And that's kind of a profound idea, I think. There's no trade-off. That's, that's a big deal, because we've assumed for a long time that there was. I want to explore that idea a, a, a little bit. And I came across this. This is from Stephen Bungay's book, the, uh, um, uh, I forgot what it's called. Um, I'm not, I haven't got my glasses on. Stephen Bungay's excellent, ec The Art of Action, that's the name of the book. Um, thank you for whoever's, whoever's about to shout it out. But <laughs> so this, is, this model goes from outcomes, plans, and actions. We want, we want to achieve some kind of outcome, so we're going to form a plan to achieve it, then we're going to carry out the actions based on that plan, and hopefully that's going to give us an outcome. The trouble is that we're faced with these gaps. There's the knowledge gap the dis difference between what we know and what we would need to know to come up with a perfect plan. And then there's the alignment gap, the, the difference between what we say we're going to do and what we actually do. And then there's the outcome gap, the effects gap, between what actually the outcome is and what we expected the outcome to be. Traditional organizations respond to these in ways that we're all familiar with. So the knowledge gap, what we like to know versus what we know, typically a traditional organization will plan harder, um, they will analyze more, um, they will do more detailed requirements, be more specific about what it is that you want to do to be able to fix this problem. What this means is that you go slower. And we've just said there's this link between speed and quality. 
Then there's the gap between plans and actions, the alignment gap, what we want people to do and what they actually do uh, when we want them to do it. <laughs> and the, the response to this in a typical organisation is to micromanage people more closely, to try and make sure they do the right things, to implement stricter process control uh, and to add bureaucracy to the process. There's loads more rules to try and force you into doing the right things. Guess what? Makes you go slower. And then there's the, the, uh, the effects gap. This is the gap between the expected outcome, the one we anticipated when we made our plan, and the one that we actually get. The response to this, typically, we tend to do expectation management. We tend to try and under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, we sometimes do things like watermelon status reporting. If you haven't come across that idea before, it's red on the inside and green on the outside. It's very common in big organisations. <coughs> And then we increase the progr program management or project management rigour to make sure that we're going to do, to do the things, we're going to get the outcomes that we want. And again, all of this makes us go slower. The trouble is, it's worse than that, because, as I said before, this relationship between speed and quality, it's not just that we can have our cake and eat it, we can have both speed and quality, but in order to get quality, we need to move quickly and in small steps so that we can see the changes, evaluate them, understand them, and, and that's the way that we build high quality systems. In order to get speed, we need quality so that when we do make a change, we're not going to go back chasing defects and trying to figure out why this thing breaks in production and it didn't break anywhere else. Those all come at a cost. So if we want to get Speed, we need to do work with high quality. If we want to get quality, we have to move fast. So if we slow ourselves down, if we go slower, what we get is we get worse software slower, not better software because we're moving more slowly. So how can we tackle these? Because these, we can't close these gaps. They don't go away. They're always true. There's always a gap. There's, there's no perfection here. There's no way of re removing those gaps altogether. So the best way to improve the impact or reduce the impact, I should say, of those gaps is to reduce them. And we do that by going faster. We speed up, we make the gaps between our actions, we work, make work in smaller steps, we observe an outcome, we do a short, a short time horizon plan, we act on that plan and then we observe the results and then we go around that loop much more quickly. That's how, we re that's how we really impact this. So, one take on my book is work in smaller steps um, so that our software is always in a releasable state. Continuous delivery is widely misunderstood, I think. It's not about, not necessarily about deployment automation, not necessarily about test automation, it's certainly not about deploying into production frequently necessarily. Now all of those things are good ideas, but that's not what really continuous delivery is about. What it's really about is working so our software, working in small steps so our software is permanently always as close as we can get to always in a releasable state. And that has a profound impact on the way in which we work and the speed with which we work and the quality which we're able to produce. <coughs> so what determines releasability? In continuous delivery, and at the core of the book that Jez and I wrote together a few years ago, uh, is this. This is the deployment pipeline. This is a machine that is intended to be the vehicle for releasability. It's meant to be the one, the one channel to production. This is the definitive statement on the releasability of our system in continuous delivery. I think it's tended to get marginalised a little bit as an idea over the years uh, it, uh, as it's become popular. Often I talk to organisations and say, yes, we're doing continuous delivery. What they mean is somewhere, somewhere or other there's a server running Jenkins. That's not the same thing. Working so your software is always in a releasable state takes a lot of things. It changes the way in which we organise ourselves, the way in which we architect the systems that, that we're working on, the way in which we test them, uh, the way in which we deploy them. All of these things 
are modified when we're trying to just speed up this cycle and make it more efficient. In order to be able to figure out whether our software is re releasable, there's a bunch of questions that we probably want to answer. We probably want to run some tests locally because we want to make sure that our software is always releasable. So we don't want to waste time by just committing rubbish into our version control system and evaluating that. So we would like some level of confidence that it's OK. So we're probably going to check that things were working locally before we make a commit. And then we'd like feedback on whether our code works with everybody else's and whether it does what it is that we expect it to do. We want that feedback to be fast and efficient and effective to give us some direction in terms of the design and the quality of our choices at that point in the system. Then we'd like to know that the software does what our users want it to do. Is it functionally appropriate? Is it configured correctly? Can I deploy it? Is it, is, is it configured correctly so that, so that the deployment mechanism works and then it behaves appropriately when I simulate realistic scenarios? And then we'd like to know whether it's nice to use. Is it effective? Is it pleasant? Does it paint pictures in my head that allow me to extrapolate and understand where I'm going to go next? Is the system fast enough? Is the system scalable enough? Is it secure, resilient, compliant enough? All of these things might impact on whether our software is releasable or not. And what we'd like to do is that we'd like to get from our deployment pipeline a definitive statement on the releasability of our changes. If all of these things are checked and approved, then there's no more work to do. At the point at which we've transited the deployment pipeline, if the pipeline says this is good, it's releasable. By definition, pretty much. So, a deployment pipeline goes from commit, generates a release candidate that we can evaluate, and dis describes whether the, the, the outcome is releasable or not. If one test fails anywhere in the deployment pipeline, probably means our software is not ready for release. This allows us to be confident in the changes that we've made by testing our system thoroughly from a, different, a, a range of different dimensions. It allows, using automated testing, it allows us to really have confidence to release our changes because we've, we're, we're as, uh, we've checked it as thoroughly as we've, as we've been able to think of up to that point. I think of this as a, a genuine engineering discipline for software. If I can work this way, if I can create automated tests on the whole, there is a place for manual testing, but if mostly for regression testing, wholly for regression testing, yeah, I'm going to automate all of those. If all of those tests pass, I can, I'm happy to release the change into production. The downside of this is that it comes with some consequences. This is a, this is a kind of interesting idea. When I stand up here and I explain it to you, it sounds fairly straightforward, but there are some consequences to this. If we want to make changes in small steps and every step is releasable, and we want feedback on those frequently, and I'm going to show you some times shortly about how frequently I think that we ought to get those changes, then the trouble is now we've got to start organizing our work to be able to achieve that. And that starts leading us in the direction of challenging ideas like trunk-based development and e eliminating feature branching and pull requests from our development process to a large degree if we genuinely want to embrace this. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to try and, I, I, if anybody was in my talk earlier, on, I, I, earlier in the conference, I talked about engineering. Uh, and I just said that I think this is an engineering discipline. I'm just going to quickly whiz past the ideas that I talked about in my earlier presentation. If we want to be engineers, then we need to optimize for learning. The deployment pipeline is evidently a, an iterative machine. We're going to pack it, put a change through. We're going to flow through the pipeline. That's an iteration of, of eva the evaluation of our system. We're going to gather feedback in the form of tests, test results um, uh, from, from executing in our pipeline. And we're going to learn from that. We're going to make changes incrementally, growing the features of our system step by step along the way. Um, uh, and we're going to, it works as a fantastic experimental platform. 
If we want to know whether our system's fast enough, we can put some performance tests in there, run those in simulation and evaluate the performance of our system. If we want to know whether it's resilient, we can kind of start breaking pieces of the system and figure out whether, uh, whether our system's as resilient as we need it to be, and so on. It gives us this fantastic resilient platform. In terms of the empiricism of our system, we can, by automating all of these things, by the time we get out into production, we can gather telemetry from there, and if there is a defect that sneaks out into production, we can very quickly put it through the pipeline again and get it out and recover it, or an experiment that we carry out in production, or any other kind of investigation that we want to um, uh, explore. If you want to manage complexity, the testability of our system is going to drive the modularity of our system. It's going to encourage us to build systems that are architected to be more abstract, have those lines of separation within them that allow us to make changes in one place and not in another. It's going to encourage a separation of concerns because that's what testable code looks like. And it's encourages us to architect things for loose coupling and higher levels of cohesion. So let's have a little look in a bit more detail about the, the way in which we're going to organize some of those things. We've got some developers here. I've drawn, the, drawn this as a pair because that eliminates the need for co separate code reviews because we could code review as a pair to start with. Commit a change and that's going to trigger um, the, the commit cycle. The commit cycle, as I said earlier, is about evaluating changes from the perspective of a developer. We want very fast feedback um, to the developers uh, on whether the code does what, we, what they think it should do. Uh, there was an academic study a few years ago of production defects. Um, and what they found was that 58% of production defects were the kinds of mistakes that all developers in all languages put into code all of the time. So off by one errors, uh, conditionals the wrong way around, scoping problems, those sorts of mistakes that we're all familiar with. That's, the, that's at the root of 58% of production defects according to this study. And those are the kinds of things that test driven development and the kind of unit testing that I'm talking about here essentially eliminate. That's one of the ways in which we end up being more efficient because we don't get those sorts of bugs so often. So we're going to get these fast feedback on these things. The deployment pipeline was, was originally also built to cope with the different rates at which we need to evaluate ideas because some of these evaluations are more costly in terms of time than others. If we want to run a unit test, then that's probably going to take microseconds of doing you know, some in-memory evaluation of a small piece of code. If you want to do a performance test, we've probably got to start up some significant chunk of the system, uh, initialize it with data and pump it with, 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 uh, with cases, which is going to be take significantly longer. So the idea of the deployment pipeline, the other idea of the deployment pipeline, is that we're going to try and optimize to fail fast. We want to do the stuff that's straightforward and simple and get results back really quickly. And then, for the slower stuff, we're going to allow the slower stuff time to be able to evaluate. And we can parallelize it and do all sorts of clever engineering things to get feedback as quickly as possible. But we give ourselves the freedom to you know, deploy the whole system and try it out. You don't really want to be deploying your system in the fast feedback cycle because that's going to slow you down too much. So this is the commit cycle, and as I say, this is largely focused on supporting development. If you follow my advice and practice test-driven development, one of the other bits of feedback that you get from working this way is feedback on the quality of your design. If you do test first, test driven development, you write a test and the test is hard to write because the setup's complicated, what that's telling you is that the design of your code is rubbish and you need to redesign the code. I don't know much else that gives you that kind of feedback that early in the process on the quality of your designs. And that's one of the reasons why I value it quite so highly. The commit stage is going to evaluate from the, from the point of view of the, of, the, uh, of the developers. Is the code doing what I think it's doing? Primarily, that's what you're really, the question it's really uh, answering. And then there's the acceptance cycle. And the acceptance cycle is, is the code releasable? 
is this change safe to put into production? Is it fast enough, resilient enough, secure enough, compliant enough? All of those things. Whatever it is that determines releasability for your software, we evaluate within that, within that part of the deployment pipeline. And then there's a the final part, the final phase, which is the production phase. And this is about getting this out into production. And that may be simple or complicated. Maybe you've got production deployment with um, con canary deployments and um, blue-green deployments in multiple ways and um, failovers and multi-data centers and all that kind of stuff. And all of that stuff will be implemented as part of the production phase using infrastructure as code techniques and so on so that we reduce the variables in the whole process so that we're sure of that stuff as well. So, uh, let's look in a little bit more detail of the kinds of things that these different parts of the system are likely to be doing. The commit stage, the typical kind of model for the commit stage is something like this. If we're using a compiled language, you're going to do so, we're going to compile the code, we're going to um, uh, uh, run some unit tests, maybe do some static analysis of some kind. I quite like to automate the uh, coding standards for, for the team so that if you commit some code that doesn't meet your coding standards, it rejects the change. But you can do other kinds of static analysis that's useful. Um, uh, one of the projects I worked on, we did an uh, analysis of any input field and we did a SQL injection attack on any input field on an automated basis and just looked at the outputs to see whether any SQL had snuck through. Um, so well, there's smart things you can do to give you that fast technical feedback uh, uh, at this point. <coughs> What we're looking for at this point, as I've already said, is very fast feedback. And ideally, um, we, we want that to be in the order of minutes. Now, we're not going to be able to evaluate every use case of the system in that way. And, we, and there are different levels of testing that are, are important here. The testing that I'm describing is kind of developer-focused technical testing. We also want to have something that's more product focused. It, does the product actually do, does our software actually do what we want it to do, what our users want it to do? And that's the role of acceptance testing. For acceptance tests, what we'd really like is that we'd like to look at the software from the perspective of an external user of the system. Does it do what they need it to do, whatever that might be? Um, and we'd like to be able to evaluate the software in lifelike scenarios from that external user's perspective. And we'd like to, to do that in a production-like test environment. My preferred approach is to deploy the software using exactly the same tools, techniques, and as close to the production configuration as I can possibly achieve into a test environment and then simulate user interactions with it. This is best done with the use of uh, what are sometimes called executable specifications. We build a development process around the creation of these executable specifications that describe the behaviors, the outcomes that we would like from our system. And we'd like that to be in the language of the problem domain. This might be sounding a bit like behavior-driven development, because it is one form of behavior-driven development. But primarily, what we're trying to achieve here is a separation between what we want the system to do from how it actually does it. We'd like to be able to come up with a behavioral specification of what the system should do and the outcomes that we expect from it when it does those things from how the system actually works. And when you get this right, you can do that to the degree that you could throw away the system and replace it with an entirely different one working on a completely different tech stack and the test would still be correct. That sounds like an extravagant claim, but I've literally worked with clients that have done that using these kinds of techniques. Usually what we do is that we create a domain-specific language that allows us to cre create these test cases in some detail. We're going to deploy the system into this lifelike environment. So we're going to configure the environment to start with using infrastructure as te code techniques to make sure that those variables are controlled. Then we're going to deploy our release candidate, the sequence of bytes that will end up in production. 
as accurately as possible. We don't want that to change. We're going to evaluate the sequence of bytes that ends up in production. A jar, a XC, DLL, a tarball, a Docker image, whatever your deployable thing is, that's what we want to deploy and evaluate. Then we're going to smoke test and health check, start it up, make sure it's up and running. Then we're going to run all of these scenarios, these, these, these acceptance test ca cases. This is a fantastic way of organizing the development, and it has a lot of knock-on effects because it tends to push the behavior all the way up the stack so that you're going to prefer requirements that also say only what the system should do and not how it does it. So you're going to start establishing this ubiquitous language that describes the problems of your system that it tackles, and that's going to automatically lead you into creating these executable specifications that define that in the context of the feature that you're working on. And then you can do TDD, TDD, TDD underneath it until you've got something that passes all of those tests, and you've kind of got an automated definition of done. It's a really nice way of working. I'm not going to talk any more about acceptance testing. If you'll forgive me advertising, I have a YouTube channel and there's lots of videos that talk in more depth about different aspects of creating these DSLs and working with them. Uh, you can see some pictures of some of the, the videos there. <coughs> in general, what we're looking for in terms of feedback, I said we're looking for fast feedback. My recommendation is to optimize for that speed. Remember, there's no trade-off between speed and quality, and if we want to do high-quality work, we want to increase the speed of feedback. We can use that as a tool to drive us in the direction of better behaviors. So my advice is that from the commit stage, for the technical feedback from your deployment pipeline, what you're looking for is feedback in under about five minutes. The reason for that is because you want to be able to commit a change, wait for the result, check that it's okay, and then move on to the next piece of work in confidence that it's likely to be okay. We also want to get quite a high level of confidence that that's okay, though. That means we want good test coverage at that stage. So we're going to want a lot of tests. We want to run a lot of tests at this point. And these are best generated as the fruits of test-driven development, in my opinion, for a variety of reasons. You can read some of my stuff and watch some of my YouTube videos to find out why I think that. Um, for the whole pipeline, my advice is to aim for feedback in under an hour. And again, that sounds kind of extravagant. If, you've got, if you're working with a big, chunky system, that might sound very, very difficult to achieve. And it might be difficult to achieve. But striving to improve the situation, I believe, will kind of generically push you in the direction of better behaviors, better engineering practices along the way. Why do I pick an hour? It's kind of pragmatic uh, in some, to some degree. My observation is that the longer the, du feedback of the, the duration of the feedback for your deployment pipeline, the more difficult it is to keep all of the tests passing. Um, I worked with a, comp uh, um, a, a bunch of teams. There were about 2,000 developers working on a, a, a bunch of trading systems uh, in this company. And they had a, their primary build was a big C++ build. Um, lots of different discrete components and parts of the system in that build, services that were deployed separately from one another sometimes, but, over, but, that, but it was a large build. It took nine and a half hours to do the build and to run all of the tests overnight. They'd been running that process for about three years when I, I started working with the team, and we started looking into it. And just we didn't change anything else except start looking at improving the speed of the, that feedback. We worked to, re we tried all sorts of different things. We experimented with all sorts of diff different techniques. But to cut a long story short, we ended up bringing the build time down to uh, the, the commit stage build time down to 12 minutes. We couldn't get it down to five. And the, the rest of the build down to 40 minutes. What I was told in the, the three years preceding me joining the team, uh, they'd only ever seen two occasions where all of the tests passed. In the first two weeks after we made this change to the build, only speeding up, changing nothing else, we had two, bi two builds that passed all of the tests. And in the following two-week periods, forever after as long as I was with, at that company, 
there was at least one green build every single day. So we could just pick the results of that build and deploy it into production much more safely than what was operating, operating before. So the feedback has a dramatic change on the effectiveness of the work that we can do, the quality of the work that we can do, just by increasing feedback. There's kind of an obvious reason to think to why when you think about it. If I am working with an overnight build, I commit a change that creates a failure. I don't find out about the failure until the following day. I immediately realize, oh, well, I know what I did wrong. I commit the fix immediately. It's going to be broken for a whole working day. It's not going to be fixed until the following day, the day after that. So it's going to spend half the time broken. So the faster the cycle, the easier it is to stay on top of failures. <clears throat> if this were all real engineering, it would improve the quality and the efficiency of our work. <clears throat> I want to remind you of the results of the State of DevOps report. I think these numbers point to something important. I think these numbers point to the fact that what we're talking about here is a genuine application of scientific rationalism to solving problems in software. I think we'd call that engineering. I think we'd call that software engineering. And if we were to come up with something like a genuine engineering discipline for software, we would expect to get better results. And we do. That's what the data says. So I think that this is um, a way of creating better software faster. And I think that's as a result of us applying engineering style thinking to solving practical problems in software development. So um, I've rushed through this to try and give us a little bit of time uh, for questions. Um, but my advice to you is to treat your deployment pipeline as an important thing. Make it definitive in terms of the releasability of your system. That means that the scope of evaluation of your deployment pipeline should be a releasable thing. If you've got to, if you transit your deployment pipeline and then you've got to go and evaluate it with some more stuff before you're ready to release, it's not really a deployment pipeline. It might be useful, but it's not really a deployment pipeline. A deployment pipeline goes from commit to releasable outcome. So that says something about the deployability of our system, the size of evaluation of our software, and the efficiency with which we can evaluate it. If we start optimizing to get these definitive results, we start to see these remarkable outcomes in terms of the performance of our software development approach and process. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I, I have whizzed through that rather quickly, um, and I'm very happy to take questions. I think we've probably got about uh, t 10 or 15 minutes for questions now. Thank you.